exciting our wine simple happy hour talk uh, we're doing a daily feature now also wine simple available or einfach wine in german we're just waiting for luis gutierrez from uh, wine advocate uh, meaning robert parker and this obviously is super exciting uh, i find him a very fascinating uh, critic very fascinating person i met him and obviously i'm mega delighted to have you on i praise the sang your praise sang your praises already so uh welcome uh luis thank you for doing this this is um, very very special and while i we have a lot to talk so that's why i cut straight to the chase uh we met last year the first time at the wine bar i remember you came into the wine bar and i said I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> and well, you know, crazy people know each other. Um, <laughs> I know you look back and said, who is this guy? <laughs> and we got to know each other a little bit. We tasted also. And um, I said, uh, yeah, I said, this is a really, really cool guy. And that's when I asked you to come on. And you said, kindly enough, yes and we're running this over wine advocate so wine simple is always one thing i wrote wine simple also to, to you know not to talk only from collector to collector but also to talk to people who are new to the wine and who are often intimidated because we often throw words around you know volcanic soil and this is uh Kimmerichian soil and this means for often for people not much and they check out so and often you know the human side gets lost and in your rec most recent book, you pointed the human perspective out, and I am absolutely in love uh, with your book, but I come to this later. But you came from the IT <laughs> yes. business, right? This is very typical. This is, was your original job, no? Yes. I, I used to work for a big multinational or Tetra Pak mm -hmm. for 22 years. Uh, I started on the IT department, you know, and then I moved on uh, to management and I was going to meetings and sending emails every day. <laughs> and so, so uh, where, did wine, uh, where did wine came into the game? Wine was uh, just a passion. It was a hobby that, uh, you know, became really, really intense uh, to the point that I, it took over my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> Yes, so um, I left. I left my job, and and um, and I haven't worked ever since. <laughs> this is the best way to do it. But did you grow up with wine? Was this part of your childhood already? Well, not 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 really, not really. I think my parents' uh, generation in Spain they were not into wine. Uh, wine was not uh, associated with pleasure. Wine was, was part of the daily intake of, you know, vitamins and minerals and nourishment. And it wasn't, you know, what we understand today. Uh, it was also poor quality and very different. Mm -hmm. And people were not into wine. Wine was not cool at all, you know. So I think the generation between my grandparents and my parents you know, was very different. My grandparents were into wine, my parents were not. And then it's my generation that resumed this and, and started getting into wine. Recently, quite recently. Yeah, so you are obviously a wine critic for a wine advocate. Uh, you're reviewing Spain, Portugal. No, not Portugal. No, Por uh, sorry, Spain, Portugal, Argentina, China, <laughs> not and Portugal. Jura. Not Portugal, Spain, uh, Spain, Argentina, Chile, and Jura, which is a so bit weird. Would you, exactly, because that's my question. <laughs> How did that end up on your, <laughs> and you pointed this recently out when we were with Stefan Reinhardt. Um, how does that, how does that work? How did you get on Jura? Well, I volunteered to do the Jura. Uh, because one of our one of our critics left, uh, David Silnek, mm -hmm. who was covering a lot of regions around the, the world, and uh, and when he left, uh, 
you know, Stefan took over most of his regions, um, but they never they never talk about uh, Jura. The Jura was an obscure region that it's only recent that has become trendy, you know. Mm -hmm. And then nobody was doing Jura and nobody was missing it. Uh, I I got interested in Jura like ten years ago. I cannot say I have been into Jura forever. It's a, it's a fairly recent thing, you know, and it, it's, a, it's a new development, if you want. And, um, and it was Neil Martin that pushed me to volunteer for the Jura. Uh, when he was covering Burgundy, he volunteered to do um, Oregon. And, you know, I said, but Neil, you know, you, you are nuts. You have already so many regions to cover and, and so many wines to taste and review that you volunteer to, 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 uh, to do Oregon. And he said, well, you know, it's Pinot Noir. There are some similarities with Burgundy and so on and so forth. And I tell you what, I think you should volunteer for the Jura. I thought, Neil, you're nuts, you know. I, why should I do that? You know, ah, you know the region, you have contacts there, you like the wines, you have access to the producers, which is not easy. Uh, and, and, you know, and there is some kind of link with the sherry wines that you love so much. You know, because there's some commonalities between some wines from sherry, the Fino and Manzanilla, the floor wines, and the Evangelion from uh, Jura. And, and I think... People in Spain who understand a little bit about sherry can understand maybe the Vangion and the and the veil ones from Jura a little better than, than people that come from no background at all. So I volunteered, you know, in the end I said, okay, yes, I think you're right. You know, what the hell, why not? So uh, so that's that's like a hobby within my job. <laughs> that's a hobby within my hobby. Yeah. <laughs> so since you talk about this, how does one become a wine critic? Since you don't work. In my in my case, it was pretty weird because it was it was really a hobby that outgrew the hobby and took over, you know, my life. Um, I was I was already writing and tasting in Spain for El Mundo Vino, and we did some stuff with with some other friends, you know, one of the guys who then became one of the founders of Equipo Navazos and the Cherry and uh, Victor de la Serna, who's a well-known journalist here and so on. And it was just a group of friends, you know, doing very intense hobby, uh, tasting, writing, traveling, buying wines, going to dinner together, uncorking 30 bottles of wine, and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, we wrote a book together about Rioja, uh, I wrote for Jamsis as a hobby for a couple of years until, you know, one day I got a phone call from uh, from the editor of The Wine Advocate and uh, there was a question that was uh, simple. What do we need to do so you come and work for us? And, you know, I said, well, you have to maintain my family. And uh, <laughs> it was Lisa Perotti Brown. She said, fine. And I said, okay. And that was it. That was the job interview. And... Uh, but that is very, very unusual. And it's quite hard to make a living out of writing about wine, uh, especially if you want to do it independently, meaning we don't have adverts, we don't have sponsors, we don't have links with any of the trade wineries or anything. And that is hard, you know, because there's not enough volume of subscribers, people paying for your information to keep it independent. So there's very, very few jobs in the, in the world. And, you know, and I was lucky enough to be offered, you know, one of the very few, and, you know, especially for, you know, my, my, especially my country for Spain, uh, which is not, you know, as, as important and as sexy as Burgundy, uh, Bordeaux, Napa, well, not not to the, say that the general public, let's say, less, less well-known, less well-known. 
So and then uh, and then with with Spain, you know, came Argentina and Chile because of the, you know, the, the language, the common language, and the, and the a lot we share a lot of culture and and links. But uh, you know, but but there was not a lot of wine links between our countries. You know, we were really far away, so uh, it made me learn a lot and meet a lot of people and discover new places, new wines. And, and, you know, at first, you know, I was so nervous that I was thinking, you know, I, I don't want to do this, you know, I'll do this for a while and then I can send it to hell. You know, I don't want to. And now I, I don't want to give it up, of course. I, I just, I love it, you know. So how does it, I mean, this, these are not normal times, but how does under normal circumstances a day as a wine critic look like? Well, in the, the, the main part of, of my job is that I have to taste and review wines. Uh, so arranging to be able to write about 4,000 wines per year, that, uh, that is a full-time job. Because you have, to, you have to find the wines. You have to manage to get samples, uh, meet People go to the vineyards, talk to them, and and then do it. You know, taste it, learn about the uh, the places, the people, and and be able to write something that makes sense for our readers, because we are you know supposed to guide our readers to find the wines they are going to like. So the the days are very very, they can be very different. You know. Uh, Everybody has bad days at work. You know, a bad day at work for me looks like 10 hours in front of my computer and I need to taste 100 wines. And my, my speed is more or less 10 wines per hour. That's, you know, when I have no distraction mm -hmm. and I have, you know, some help to uncork the wines, pull the wines and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then, you know, if I have to taste 100 wines, because sometimes you cannot have more time, uh, that is a very tough, that is a very tough day, very tough day. Uh, it's very tiring. And sometimes I have to do that four or five days in a row because I need to taste, you know, a huge number of wines in, in a short space of time. Some other days I'm, I'm traveling, uh, I'm planning, Doing research, you know, before I do a region, I find out, you know, what's new, what developments have been done since I last tasted, and so on. I, I have a, I have a network of of wine nuts. I know all the crazy people in the wine world, especially in my region. So I, you know, you know I know the local sommeliers. I know the guys who just are wine lovers. So I ask. And I do my research and then I, I find the wines that I need to taste. How do you research? Well, because people look typically at you. People look at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I try to research before the wines come to, uh, to the market, you know, and, and uh, talking to the people who are, you know, because I'm on site, I'm in Spain, but Spain is a very large country. You know, I cannot know what is happening in every small part of, of the country. But most likely, I know people there. So I, I know people who are, you know, very close and they, are, they know, you know, if there's a new guy doing something interesting or even if the guy has the right idea and eventually will make something interesting. And then I can, I can, I can meet and find these people before they release their wines, you know. So it's through an informal network of, of friends that I've, you know, I've built over the years of, of being a, a, a wine nut. Now, I have to share a story because it was kind of a striking moment for me. We humans have a tendency always, you know, to we have a very strong opinion about something, especially if we don't know it. Yes, it's called a stereotype. Yeah. Uh, you tasted at the wine bar with a supplier and then <laughs> asked, and I joined you then, and you tasted wine from a can. 
it tasted That's them right. from the glass and from the can on top of it. And what what impressed me was it didn't make any difference to you, whether that was a canned wine or this was any other wine. You were very precise and analytical about it. And that's typically a skill set not everybody has. And then we tasted the, the Israel Leku. Yeah. Uh, the, oh. And I was surprised. We actually bought it and right away after and served it by the wine bar by the gloves. But it was the 2015. It wasn't as good as the 2016. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think now Michael Skernick has it, hopefully. But, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you know, so, so you know, tasting wines, I have to taste wines everywhere. And, and it happened that this, this, this producer from Rioja, from Artadi, the son of the, of the owner, he lives in New York, you know, and I needed to taste with him. So, you know, okay, I'm coming to New York, so why not taste there? So, mm -hmm. so we got together and we tasted a a few wines that I missed uh, when, when we tasted the, the uh, rest of the wines from their portfolio. And we tasted them uh, there. He knew you and, and he, I think he asked for, for permission to taste there. And you know, it happened that he, he had some wines in, in a can. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it was just, I, I found this is impressive because again, that's something to taste analytically is something which is very, very difficult because you have opinions. Now, mm. going on a, on a question uh, to segue over to and eventually answer some questions. You were the main contributor in 08 uh, for the book, 1001 Wines, One Must Try Before You Die. That's obviously a very catchy uh, topic. And how does, and this is a question I get quite often from people, what is an iconic wine? When we wine people talk about, you must try that wine. That's a benchmark wine. Yeah, I think I think the wine you must try is different from an icon, let's say. The icon or the iconic wine is a wine that, you know, goes beyond its region, its grape, its vintage. It's like a legend, let's say. It's it's Vega Sicilia or it's Petrus, is one of these names that, you know people associate with the greatest wines in the world, you know. It doesn't matter the region, great vintage or anything. They are, you know, uh, they transcend their region, their, their grapes and, and their vintages. I think that's, uh, that's to me an, an iconic wine, mm -hmm. you know. Then the, then the name is misused for, you know, a lot of wines and all of a sudden, you know, people start producing icons, you know, and that's, that, it's like, it's like uh, creating instant legends, you know, it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> so can you give us three wines where you'd say one must try? Well, you know, we were talking about this book, which was published, I think, around 2007, 2008. And I was flicking through the pages today and I thought, oh my God, how outdated this book is on Spain. You know, because so much has happened in the last 10 years in Spain that is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. So, you know, so, so some wines, of course, uh, in, in that book or, or in whatever, if you want to talk about wines that people need to try from Spain, you can always name uh, Viña Tondonia from uh, Lope de Heredia in, in Rioja, both uh, red and white, because they are wines that age forever. And, you know, their Grand Reserva, which is like the top of the range, the Grand Reserva is released 20 years after the harvest, till today, you know. So I'm, I'm waiting for the 2001 to come into the market next year, 20 years after the harvest, because 2001 was an unbelievable vintage. Yes. And, uh, and, you know, and some of the, some of the uh, iconic vintages in Rioja, like 64, 47, these ones are unbelievable. Nowadays, unfortunately, very, very expensive and hard to find. You know, but there was a time when 
traditional Rioja was so out of fashion that they were not selling at all. And I think Lopez de Heredia was one of the one of the few that stayed faithful to the to the style and they they used to call themselves the last of the Mohicans, you know? <laughs> and uh and I have a and I have an anecdote uh about the Lopez de Heredia Viña Tondonia and that book, if you want to uh to hear, because it it shows, you know, what it was, you know, this this must have been around I don't know exactly, 2005, five, six or something like that. Um, I, I wanted to write about Lopez de Heredia and Viña Tondonia in the book. And I wanted the 1964 vintage, which is one of these, you know, one of the best in the history of, of Rioja. So I phoned Maria Jose Lopez de Heredia. She talks a lot. And, you know, I, I told her, listen, Maria Jose, you, have you met her? She came to yes. the wine bar, actually. <laughs> Oh yes, she is. She is fantastic. I love her. Yeah, to death. Uh, so I told her, you know, listen, we are we are contributing to this book, and we need to write about, you know, some of the wines that people should try, and, and so on and so forth. And you know, I want to include the 1964 Dondonia. Oh my God, you know that's the vintage of the century, blah blah blah, blah and grandfather, blah blah blah, and this and blah blah blah. blah, blah. And, and she didn't let, let me explain what I needed because I needed a digital <laughs> image of the label, you know, which in, in, a, in a winery like Lopez de Heredia, where they have no technology, I thought, oh my God, you know, she's not going to know what a JPEG is going to be or anything like that, you know, and I need to find a digital label of the 64. I said, listen, I need a digital label. No, 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 you don't need that. You need the wine. Listen, Maria Jose, I have I have drunk the wine. I know the wine. That's why I'm going to write about it. No, 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 no. But you need to taste again because you know maybe you haven't tasted for a while. Blah blah blah. And this is a very sweet ever. And you know, and grandfather used to say and blah, blah 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 blah. And I said, but listen, I need. I really need the label. <laughs> well, listen, she sent me two bottles of the red Thondonia '64, two bottles of the red. Bosconia 64 and two bottles of the white Tondonia 64. Just just asking for a digital label, which means at the time nobody was paying any attention to them. The wines were not selling and, and nobody was even asking about them. Funnily enough, Dirk Nipport, who is a good friend of mine, was born in 64, so I had a great excuse to share the bottles with him. And I think in the end, I ended up scanning one of the labels myself uh, to to give it to the guys for the book, to Neil Beckett, the, the editor of the, of the book. So that was unbelievable. At the time, they were not selling mm -hmm. at all. That, that one. And Crazy, that's yeah. not so long ago. Huh? That's uh, yeah. 16 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, you wrote this phenomenal book, The New Vignerons which I think is, is also doing extremely well. And people follow these cultish almost producers now. And they all, in the United States, some of them are actually getting harder and harder to get. Mm. And they're, I think that segues perfectly into what you mentioned before. Um, Spain is changing rapidly. Yes. And my team actually made fun of me as Le Bernardin is a very, very French focused restaurant. They made fun of me since at least uh, a year to 18 months. Um, that I'm all of, a sudden, all of a sudden, as an Austrian sommelier, I'm on this heavy Spanish trip. And we are a French restaurant. I said, but the wines are great. <laughs> and I see. <laughs> and can you show us the book? Because I have it on my iPad and I have it on my phone. Uh, so have it constantly handy because I look, but you have it in, in printed version, which looks better on Instagram. That's certainly a book, uh, a must read uh, to me. It's it's a stellar book and showcases also so producers. And has some incredible photos of vineyard. This is a vineyard in Tenerife from Envinate. Yes, yeah. yeah. incredible. Yeah, you know, uh, this was a project to to do a book with a with a friend who's a photographer and an excuse to 
to travel around Spain, eat and drink our, our way around Spain for, for we, we took like 16 months, which is the time, my cycle to go around all my, all my regions. So at the but same it's... time as I was, I was traveling to the regions to taste wines and research and, and visit vineyards and so on and so forth, we took some extra time to, to, to visit these guys and, and, and have the photos and the stuff to write the, the chapter mm -hmm. on that. But what I find so brilliantly, rather than you know, writing necess only writing about the deep technical parts, you grab the reader regardless on the knowledge level and put him on this journey. And when you read into it, you almost feel like you have the opportunity to, tra to travel literally with you. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the aim for me was that my mom could read the book. My mom is not a wine geek, I tell you. You know, she knows nothing about wine. You know, but she might enjoy reading about places, about people, about culture, about gastronomy, uh, looking at unbelievable landscape, you know. And uh, so I wrote the book thinking about what you, what you said in the beginning. Normal people, you know, because we tend to, to talk about stuff that scares normal people off, you know. And I avoid it. There is, there is no tanning in the in the whole of the book you know because i searched for the word you know i made sure i didn't even write tanning so there's nothing technical about it it's a, it's a, it's stories about people and places you know? and one thing food yes absolutely and because because to me wine is very much part of the of of gastronomy you know, and, and we have a very rich gastronomy in Spain. Uh, we have a lot of local foods and local wines, and often they work together very well. You know, so we made, the, the book is, is a series of profiles of, I think it's 14 producers, from all from different regions, one from each, uh, to be able to show, you know, the different landscapes, to, to be able to show what is the Ribeira Sacra, and you know what is Priorat and what is Jerez and what is Tenerife, you know, and and also what do they eat there, you know, and let people know what the hell is paella and what is gazpacho and what is cocochas and what is a lot of you know the foods from Spain that all of a sudden you know people want to to hear about and they want to eat and try, and and so we made them all. We make them cook the dishes from the regions uh, when we visit them for the book. So, you know, it was a lot of fun. They had to cook. You know, we helped and, you know, we were taking some photos and, and talking and having fun and then eating the food with them, with the wine. And, you know, that is to me what wine is about. Wine is, is part of, of the gastronomy, of the local culture, and wine is for sharing. Sharing, enjoying. And, and pleasure, and so we did that with uh, with pleasure. <laughs> so let's profile a couple of producers. Um, you brought already Envina Te up, which right now is obviously the raising star. I, as a matter of fact, uh, drink one right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not from Tenerife, though, from Ribera Sacra, which you mentioned already. I had yes, two, yes. I had one from Tenerife two days ago, and I loved it. Yes, yeah, so these, these guys are four university friends, you know, who studied and, and shared a, a flat. They lived together and uh, they were studying enology, of course. And, uh, and when they finished, they, they must have had so much fun together, you know, and think about your student days, you know, the, probably the best days of our life, when, you know. And, and so they must have had such a great time together that they decided to have a business together. And none of them come from uh, families with vineyards or wine backgrounds. So they had to start from zero. So they had to start, um, you know, working in other wineries and advising other wineries. 
So they set up a, like a consulting business and, and they started helping wineries in different regions. They are all from different regions. So, um, so they started working in their regions. So one is from Galicia and one is from the Canary Islands, from Tenerife. Uh, two of them are more or less from the Mediterranean. So they started finding customers and, uh, and working for them and also trying to make a little bit of their own wine. So uh, they started with a, with a small business uh, making wines in, in four different regions. And, uh, and two of them, they still work as consultants for other companies because they don't still generate enough money to, to make a living out of it. Uh, but that as you to said, me is mind boggling. It's, it's, they, are, they are rock stars, you know? But their production is very limited because they found some amazing vineyards, you know, like, like the one on the cover of the book is, is uh, one of their wines. You know, that often their, their, their production is very small and, you know, and they started selling their wines when they were unknown. So the price they were asking for couldn't be very high. And then it's very hard to put the prices up. So they're still, they're still trying to make their business uh, profitable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's unbelievable. And that, that's very, very recent. You know, I, I met them when they were uh, staging for, for one of the wineries in the Mediterranean, when they finished university. So... Uh, in a, in a winery called Casa Castillo in Jumilla, mm -hmm. where they have an incredible monastery. Um, so the guy from Casa Castillo, he introduced them to me, and they were, you know, students coming out of university, uh, wine nerds coming out of university. I said, oh, these guys, you know. And uh, now they are, they are rock stars. Huh? Rock stars. And everybody loves them, and but also the wines. But I noticed, especially in the whites, they need time in the glass. They challenge you at first. Yes, yeah, some some of the wines can be reductive. You know, uh, they work in the Canary Islands with very volcanic soils uh, in Galicia. In some of the wines, so some of the wines need a little bit of air. They have been working to get rid of that. Uh, you know, uh, so you don't have to do it yourself. And, and I think the wines are becoming more approachable, uh, you know, when you first open the, the bottle. But sometimes they can be a bit, uh, yeah. Another winery which you profiled and also a rising star is Commando G. Yeah. I mean, I had one, yes I had one yesterday. The entry level, Bruja de Rojas. Um, yeah. Delicious. That's... Uh, you know, that's an amazing story because that's not only a, a project that uh, only started, they, they made their first wine in 2008 as a hobby. You know, they also had their 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 day jobs, you know, their, their own project or family project or whatever. And But uh, it's not only a new project, it's a new wine region. It's an amazing wine region, which is, you know, one hour away from, from Madrid city. I live in Madrid, so it's one hour away from, from, uh, from my house uh, to, to this uh, Sierra de Gredos, the Gredos mm -hmm. Mountains. And, um, you know, in a lot of places in, in Spain, people have been growing grapes because they needed to make wine to drink. You know, same as they needed wheat to make bread. Uh, but they never made you know, quality wines and, and you need to realize that, you know, Spain with our history coming from a civil war, a poor country and so on and so forth, wine was food. It was not gastronomy, you know, it was not enjoyment. It was survival. And, and, and they made wine just like that. And, and, you know, and the wine from there ended up mostly in, in cartons, you know, in Tetra Pak. Yeah. Which is the company that I yeah, used to work for before for 22 <laughs> years. Yeah. But those vineyards look all of a sudden, crazy, yeah? yeah. And all of a sudden there is a region with no young vines 
So all the vines are 50 plus years old, high altitude granite soils with garnacha, a grape that has become trendy, but before nobody wanted to hear about it, you know, nobody wanted to hear about our, our Mediterranean grapes in the past. So, you know, Garnacha, Cariñena, Monastrel, people avoided them like hell. Why is know? that? Uh, well, you know, uh, there was a time when it seemed like only French grapes were good, you know, and, and, and we had some kind of inferiority complex, let's say. And we didn't believe we could make great wines with, with our grapes. You know, we, was, we were saying, oh, you know, but, you know, with our grapes. Well, of course, maybe with your grapes, you cannot do a Bordeaux. But uh, you can do different stuff. And this is what's happening now uh, in, in many of these regions. You know, the, even the Canary Islands is very recent, the quality wines from there. And in these ingredos, all of a sudden, there's a, there's a whole region of all vines, high altitude and fantastic soils to give, you know, mineral wines, sharp wines, the wines that all of a sudden the market wants, you know, so this was like a miracle. And these guys were one of the first to, to, to see it. And they started making wine from from there, and they championed the region and the grape. And they uh, again, they are a success story, like uh, like a Mina. Yeah. Thing. They they are young young people, uh, also you know coming out of university, and then starting a project together as a as a hobby. And today they are making some of the most amazing wines, not only in, in Spain, but you know. I cannot think of many wines with garnacha as good as you know their their top bottlings. They have some, they have some unbelievable vineyards, and and you know, it, you have to go to these places and and realize, you know, the the landscape is so dramatic and and so intense that if you capture that and you put it in 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 the in the wine in the bottle, then you you make people travel to, to the places. And that's, that's what the, this new generation in Spain are, are trying to do. And there's, you know, there's different people in, in, uh, in Galicia and in Catalonia, uh, in Rioja, in Jerez, everywhere, you know? So it's, uh, it's super exciting. It's another producer because he just edged it. Uh, if you go to Penedes, uh, and it's, he's a friend, obviously, Pepe Raventos because there's a yes. much different family back from coming and seeing what he does. Yeah. It's quite, it's quite moving and the wines are not expensive. Yes. You know, so, so these, these people have something in common is, is their, their goal, but their background can be very different. And Pepe Raventos comes from a family that invented Cava they invented the sparkling wine from, from Penedes and from, from Catalonia, if you, if you like. But he was the, the one to leave the appellation because the appellation had been turned into a, a supermarket category, you know? The fight between the, the large producers to get market share, you know, push the prices down. And when you push the price down, the quality is going to go down. And it came to a point where, you know, quality producers didn't want their name to be associated with the name of the region or their, you know, their appellation, which is super sad, you know, you have to, you have to let go your origin and you don't want to hear the name. And Pepe was the first to do that, you know, he left the, the Cava appellation, you know, because he wanted to, to pursue quality and found that he was constrained within the uh, within the appellation and then of course he moved to New York for uh, three four years you know to, to promote and, and build his network of, of customers and he did it very well you know and uh, 
I, I, I met him once in, in New York you know, and he was going to all the, all the places and, you know, everybody knew yeah. him. <laughs> he's, a, he's a very lovely guy. Yeah, he's a very so, lovely guy. Yeah, he's a, he's a great guy. So you can, you know, people can, can read the stories about these people. This is what the book yeah. is about. You can read about them, their background, their families, their regions and, and what they're doing today. Um, one thing what struck me, you put also in your book, you wrote about one wine, especially one, one category, which seems to be in an absolute recession. You wrote about Malus Mama, a sweet wine. Oh, and wow. when yes. I look at people, how people order sweet wines, it's kind of, to me, they don't want to drink it. And I said, those can be the greatest wines in the world. You guys are crazy. Right. And when you look at the yeah. story of Malu's mama, at first we couldn't get it in America. And then all of a sudden I got an offer half a year after. And we, I bought it immediately. I bought everything what we got. And when you get, when you give this to people, I mean, this is a crazy wine. Yeah. What, what struck you to write in a, in a, in a style of wine like that? And especially this is even from apples. It's not even from wine. <laughs> Well, yes, this is not even wine, you know, this is, this is actually, technically, it would be cider yeah. because it's made with apple juice, you know, and, uh, and I, wanted to, I wanted to write about the Basque country, you know, because the Basque country is important. And the wine from Basque country is Chacolí, yeah? Uh, so I found a guy who makes Chacolí but the other big drink in, in the Basque country is cider. So this guy was making nice chocolate, some crazy uh, experiments with, uh, you know, semi-sparkling rosé stuff and uh, what have you, uh, some funky stuff. But he was making this amazing ice cider, ice cider, like ice vine, but uh, with, with apples. And, you know, first time I tasted this, it was just incredible because it was like liquid apple tart, you know? And it was sweet, but it had as, you know, because the, the, to me, the, the secret for sweet wines is that they don't feel sweet. You know, they might have 300 grams of residual sugar, but they don't have to feel mm -hmm. sweet, you know? And this has acidity like, like a vintage Madeira. Yes, but it has also, you know, sharp, sharp and it's depth, sharp as a knife. And it ages, you know, he sells it seven years after the harvest. And it's aged in, in barrel like a wine. Everything is produced like a, like a quality wine, but with concentrated, concentrated, you know, and, and this is what the ice cider comes uh, from, you know. He removes water from, from the juice uh, freezing it, yeah, Malus Mama. So, so it's a, it's an incredible thing from the from the Basque country. Uh, very very unique. It's a it's a product that you know, uh, it's a category that almost doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, no, it, it's just. But I, uh, I found it so delicious and, and so fascinating mm -hmm. that you know I had to. No, no, I found this I found this impressive because you could have written written about many other producers probably easily. Yeah, you know, I didn't, my, it would be very easy to write about, you know, Peter Sisek, Alvaro Palacios, and so on and so forth. I love these guys, you know, and they have done a great job, and they, they, we owe them so much. But, you know, that was, not, that was not my idea. I wanted to showcase people that were not that well known, you know, even though some of them are, we're saying, they're now rock stars. Yeah. But they were, they were not, you know. I knew them as, you know, kids coming out of university. Yeah. One category which we did, or one producer we did at Le Bernardin super, super well, is Rodrigo Mendes with his Alvarinos. Oh. I mean, and you, we gave people, you know, um, Alvarinos, and they looked at her, you want to give me an Alvarinho? I said, yeah, mm. <laughs> try it. <laughs> if you don't like it, don't worry about it. Yeah. And the response was crazy. Yeah. Because, you know, there's, there's so many preconceived ideas and, 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 and stereotypes, you know, like 
Alvariño or white wine has to be drunk, you know, within the year, you know, before the next harvest. Uh, and, and Alvariño is a, is a grape that can age really yeah. well, you know, and, and you can have, you know, five-year-old Alvariño, 10-year-old Alvariño. It's amazing. And it, it, it's like any other wine. It just changes, you know, the profile when the wine is very young and the profile when the wine is aged is, is mm -hmm. different. So the aromatic change, the texture changes, um, but it's a, it's a wine that is so delicious and goes so well with oh. seafood, you know, and, and which, you know, for La Bernadette makes a lot of That's sense. That's home run. So, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, he's also in my book, yeah. you know, and, and he, he started working with Raul Perez, which, uh, which is a very famous uh, winemaker from Spain. Quite a character. And then, <laughs> oh yes, and, and they were, uh, I tasted with him this morning on video conference. <laughs> I'm, I'm tasting on video conference now. Uh, so they, they did some experiments like, you know, aging Alvariño under the sea <laughs> and some stuff like that. Uh, and, and they have also started making delicious red wines from Galicia. Because people associate Galicia, Rias Baisas with Alvariño, with white wine. Uh, but they can also produce, you know, delicious, uh, fresh and sharp Atlantic uh, reds. Mm -hmm. And they are, you know, and they have a lot of local grapes. Caíño, Espadeiro, Loureiro, and, and uh, yeah. What are you drinking? Because people keep asking. What I'm... What am yeah, I because I, I'm not sipping. even looking at the question. Oh, <laughs> my God. Yes, sorry. So right now, I'm tasting, you know, now that people are home and they're reading, we are trying to, to, to taste and, and make shorter articles. So I'm going to make a, an article on Ribeira Sacra. I normally do a, an article on Galicia, which would cover all the regions. But to make it faster, I'm, I'm, I'm right now tasting Ribeira Sacra, and I don't normally, I don't normally drink the wines I taste because most most of the time I don't I don't taste them at home. But nowadays I have so many open bottles that you know my neighbors cannot keep up. <laughs> so I'm drinking a, a little. I'm drinking I'm drinking a, a white wine. From 2012, from from the first quality winery in uh, in Ribera Sacra, Algueira, and this is actually a blend of 40% Alvariño, 40% Godello, and the remaining Treisadura. Mm -hmm. You know, bottled and oaked 2012. They're going to re-release re as a library release, uh, and it's and it's super. You know, I was I was telling you that. Uh, Alvariño can be aged, and, and this, is a, this is a blend, but it's a, it's a great example. So it's Algueira uh, Cortezada, which is the name of the vineyard. And, and what I also love about this is that there's another winery called Fedellos do Couto mm -hmm. from Rias uh, Ribeira Sacra. I don't know if you get it in, uh, in New York. Fedellos do Couto. The, the name is hard to pronounce. Maybe the spelling... Doesn't doesn't bring any idea of uh... <laughs> so these guys they also make a red cortezada so they make a red from the same vineyard so you know we start to see the situation where people are naming their wines af after the origin and people are sharing names because the wines come from the same place you know? I see so we don't European have, like, wines European centers import the wines. Oh yeah, yes. Okay. Well, you need to you need to try those, especially their bastarda, which is the true yeah. so, uh That that is delicious. And these guys, they they also make a red cortezada. So you know, and it's happening in in Bierzo. Uh, there there are you know I think five different producers making wine from the same crew and naming all the wines with the name of the of the vineyard. Which is unusual because people used to have uh, trademarks and all the brand names, you know, were owned by one 
winery and you know they wouldn't dream sharing and now people understand that origin is origin and if wine comes from there you know both wines they have the same name you know same as happens in burgundy people don't have problems sharing you know clovujo or eschesso yeah you know their wines come from there I, yes, I'm drinking a white from Rivera Sacra. Yeah. Change quickly the continent and go quickly to South America. Oh, yeah, um, 13 hours flight. There seems to be quite some developments. I have just been in Argentina and, you know, we Argentine typically we know about Malbec, but not much more. But you see a huge shift there right now and what seems to be mm. almost they orienting, orienting themselves a little bit on Spain. Well, you know, some, some producers in Argentina have been inspired by, by what is happening in Spain because we've been sharing more in the, in the last uh, few years. Uh, so, you know, the, I think the big change is that they are now talking about origin and not about grapes. Uh, so the hot word for Argentina would be Hualtayari, you know, which is a high altitude place in, in uh, Valle de Uco. And, you know, it happens to have, you know, very good terroir, unusual limestone soils, which, you know, they're not common in Argentina, high altitude. And they are finding that, you know, different places give different character to the same grape. And, you know, Selling grape variety wines is a little bit dangerous, you know? If your customer learns to come into a steakhouse, order a steak and a Malbec, you know, all of a sudden they can start producing Malbec in China you know, much cheaper than in Argentina. And, you know, people will get their Malbec cheaper, but it won't be from Argentina. It will be Malbec, you know. But then, Gualtayari, you cannot no. copy. It's a place. And it's a combination of, you know, soil, altitude, climate, orientation, and the grape. I've noticed also they start playing so with the also a little bit. <laughs> yes. Yes, some of the guys, you know, they have been to Spain, they have been to Sherry, they have seen how some of the producers have learned how to use the the floor, the, the veil of yeast on top of the wine to make the wines sharper, you know, because the uh, floor, the, the yeast eat glycerin and makes the wines thin, which is what fino means. So to make the wine sharper, you can you can use the, the yeast, uh, the floor, and some of them are doing it. Sometimes also to add, you know, complexity of flavor and aromas and, and give them a, a little bit of a Jura sherry. No, it was uh, very interesting. Twist. It's very, very interesting to see. Yeah. You're, you're probably talking about the Michelin yeah, yeah. brothers, huh? Yeah, they, they've been to Spain too many times. They've been contaminated. <laughs> <laughs> How do you see the, the developments in Chile? Because that seems to be also quite uh, quite shifting. And very exciting wines yes, coming from it there. Is. You know, if, if, if I have to tell you, I think Spain is as much as new world as Chile is and, and Argentina. Because in Chile and Argentina, you know, they've been making wine since, you know, we discovered America and we brought the European grapes there to, to make wine for mass. You know, so they've been making wine for a long time, you know, but they have not developed the wine culture, you know, we see in countries like uh, France or Italy. And in Spain, because of our history, you know, we were isolated for 40 years uh, isolated from the rest of the world and, you know, and wine was not the culture. So, so the wine culture is kind of new, is, is, is coming back. It was way before, 
uh, you know, but there's been a gap when I, when I talk about the generation of my parents not drinking wine, you know, and, and people, you know, you don't see uh, families with cellars full of all vintages of wines unless they're, you know, they have bought them recently because, you know, there was no wine culture. And then in Spain, I think we have made the same mistakes they made in Chile and Argentina trying to chase you know, the latest fashion and trying to make wines to please, you know, whatever fashion. And we are now finding our way and, you know, finding our roots and understanding the, the, the potential of the different places. In the case of Spain, the local grape varieties that, you know, unfortunately they don't have in, in, uh, in America, but, uh, but they, are, they are on the same path. They are on the same path. And they are maybe a little bit behind, but I think, I think the, the, what is happening there, it's, it's replicating what, what is happening in yeah. Spain. You know, and then, of course, the two countries have a slightly different uh, cultures and, and backgrounds. So Chile is, is a bit different from Argentina. Also, if you think about the geography of wine, you know, Chile maybe can be more diverse. It's, Chile is super thin and long and, you know, and, and the wine is spread when in Argentina, you know, 80 something percent is in, uh, in the province of Mendoza. Yeah. But, you know, but it's super exciting and they are going for, uh, you know, some crazy stuff. I love the, the wines from Alcohuaz in, in mm -hmm. North, in, in Elqui, where they have planted vines at 2,200 uh, meters, you know, in, in the middle of nowhere. And they have planted garnacha and cariñena and Mediterranean grapes. And, and they, they get ripe, you know, it's unbelievable. Not the... Yeah, it's super exciting, you know. You think about the stereotype, and, and it's boring because it's, it's very much industrial wine, you know, and supermarket brand. And that, that's the wine that, you know, doesn't interest me, doesn't interest you, doesn't interest, you know, most people that are, are listening to us. Uh, but, you know, but there's really cool stuff uh, happening there. And, you know, even my, my friends in Spain, they're reluctant to, to try the wines from there because they have the stereotype in their heads. You know, because most of these wines, the quality wines don't reach our market here. <coughs> We're too far away and we produce too much wine. And, and, you know, most of the time I have to give my friends the wine's blind, you know, and once they are blown away by the wine, you know, I can tell them, well, this is from Chile, you know, and they go, oh my God, this is from Chile. <laughs> it's yeah. true. Well, you point out one yeah. thing and we have to close and wrap up very soon. It's a good friend of mine is an importer, is Doc Polaner, and one of his lines is always open up your mind and taste. Because no matter what, you, you might have a very good friend who loves this and that wine. You might not like that wine. And, that's okay. There's no yeah. judgment to that. So oh, absolutely. You know, scratch whatever that is. You have your own opinion. You know, one loves oysters, the other one doesn't. So who is right and who is wrong? No mm -hmm. one. Um, no, it's a, it's, it's a matter of opinion. Um, and a matter of taste also, you know. A matter of taste, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that should be our closing statement. Thank you so much for coming on. Can you show again... Well, wow, thanks for Can having you me. Show again, uh, your book, just to make sure uh, people know that because it's such a great piece, and um, it's something. I mean, I probably my the sommeliers will hate me because now all the wines becoming even more rare than they already are. <laughs> 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 and yeah, there, there's a few guys after after these wines in. Uh, no, they're in super allocated already, so you have to battle around it. And yeah, so thank you so much. And we, again, we're on tomorrow again for another happy hour of Wine Simple. And cheers to that. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you, Aldo. Thank you. Bye-bye.